Okay. I had two people tell me, please um, record this. So I'm trying to remember to record. Okay. So um, what I will be doing is I will be sending these PowerPoint slides and the video over to um, the webmaster for the Presbytery of New Covenant. He will put it on the Presbyterian Women's webpage. And um, since I have all of your email addresses, I'll probably send you a link to the web page so that you will be able to go in there. And I have all of my notes. In fact, some of the things I don't say will be in the notes too. So um, just remember that one. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you a Bible story. And I think it'll help to explain a couple of things of why I'm going to be doing the things I'm going to be doing. By the way, this is two hours. So if y'all want to break, if you want to get up and go to the bathroom or go get something to drink, just get up and go because I am not stopping. It's two hours straight. Um, okay, so if we go back and remember a Bible story in Matthew 22, if you'll remember where the disciples of the Pharisees, they go up to Jesus where he's teaching and they're trying to trick him so that they can get him um, arrested by the, the Romans. And so the question they ask is should we be paying taxes to the Romans? And so Jesus says, pull out a coin. Whose picture is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. And remember Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. And that begs the question, so what is God's? And so basically from the creation story, we know that God created human in his own image and then he also uh, created everything else. He created the, the wind, the air, the um, sky, the lights, um, the birds, the fish, the animals, and he created other humans. And every time he created something, he pronounced it as being good. And so we know that God created us to work the land and to take care of all of God's creations. And so therefore, we know that God expects us to be caretakers or stewards of his creation. And because everything that God created and made it good, he wants us as stewards to follow in his footsteps and keep everything good. And so our author says in the introductory video, she says she put together this um, study because people asked her to put together a study on environmental justice. And if I go back to this story about the disciples of the Pharisees asking Jesus's question, trying to trap him, they were focused more on the political side instead of on the, the God side, the biblical side. And I think this book is focused more on political thinking and personal opinions than on Bible study. And I don't believe that a politician should be able to come into a worship service and give a political speech. And I don't believe Bible study should be giving out political thinking and personal opinions. And so therefore, I was thinking about actually not doing this overview at all. But then I got to thinking, well, I believe in the topic of God's earth and taking care of it. And I always do the overview, giving additional ideas and, and resources and things like that. And so my goal is to do exactly the same thing. My goal is to give you, um, to highlight things in the book that I think are good, but also to give you additional resources and things to do like that. And so I hope um, everybody, when you get through with this overview, understands kind of why I suggested doing things a little bit different than what um, our author has it. But if you would like to do exactly the way the author has it, man, she has got tons of resources. And if it'll work, there we go. So let's start talking about some of the resources that are provided for you. Okay, so first of all, the Bible study book 
It's $10 this year, just an FYI. Next year, it's going up to $14. So if you have a subscription to the Horizon Magazine, you automatically get your uh, Bible study book with that free. And the, the Horizon subscription is not going up next year, but the Bible study book is. And then the uh, companion DVD is $20. Okay, so the author of our book is Reverend Dr. Patricia, or Trisha is what she likes to be called, Tall. And I was not, I was still working. I was not part of the Bible study in 2001, 2002, but she's the one who wrote Esther's Feast if you um, were doing the studies at that time. And again, she says in the intro um, that she was asked to do this study about environmental justice. So why'd they ask her to do it? Um, basically, she's a climate activist. She and her husband, Reverend Don uh, Summerfield, they live in a net, well, basically a net zero energy home over in Henryville, Indiana. And they um, live on 50 acres and they grow a lot of their food. And in fact, she went over to the state of Washington and Oregon to get their architect and their construction manager because she felt like they did a better job than in Indiana of trying to make a net zero home. Uh, she's devoted her post-academic life to lecturing and preaching and leading workshops uh, to help congregations seeking effective ways to address climate change. And in 2013, she wrote a book called Inhabiting Eden, Christians, the Bible and the Ecological Crisis. And she explains in, in the um, DVD that she didn't really know if she could get enough information out of the Bible to write uh, this book in 2013. And she was surprised that she could draw as much information as she could. So Reverend Rebecca Barnes is the um, author of our suggestions for leaders. Uh, she, both of her parents were pre Presbyterian pastors, so she did a lot of volunteering and, and uh, community activities when she was growing up. And one of the things that she got involved was um, the crop hunger walks. And that kind of led her to her job that she's had for the last seven years. She's the coordinator of the Presbyterian Hunger Program. And then while she was in seminary in 2011 at Louisville, she uh, wrote a paper called 50 Ways to Help Save the Earth, How You and Your Church Can Make a Difference. All right, this is in my way. Let's see if, can I get that up there? Nope, okay, I'll just have to look at my notes instead of my screen. Okay, so um, just an FYI, in the Horizons website, they have where you can order all of your materials. But if you look at that fourth sub bullet, uh, the links to the websites, um, I have this right here. This is the handout that they have at that link. And when they're um, describing information in the book and also in the suggestions for leaders, a lot of times they have websites to go to or, or different things to talk about. Um, some of the things that she's talking about in the book. And so this is all divided lesson um, by the lesson with all of the links for those things that she talks about. There's also the PW blog, which you can go to from the Horizons website. And um, if you've gotten, if you have a subscription to Horizons, the summer one's already come through and it has um, information for lesson one and two. And so there's two pages for each of that that'll give you additional information and additional questions that might be helpful. And then I have a link there for today's information, but I will try to send you that link. But remember when you go to the PowerPoint, go to the, the notes page view and it will give you all of my notes. Man, this is not working right and going to the next page, there we go. Okay, so if you have your book, let's kind of go through the contents of the book. If you look on page two, you will see um, a little bit about the authors and then also about Lorraine Roy, 
who did all of the artwork. And even though the, the artwork, like on the front of the book and each one of the lessons, it looks like it's hand done embroidery and stuff, but she doesn't. She does all of this on the sewing machine and she's very good at it. Uh, page three and four, it will give you a table of contents. Page five and six, it explains a little bit about the artwork for each one of the lessons. Page seven, it tells you things to look for in the study. And then page eight, that'll give you the scope and sequence. Um, I very much would ask that everybody try to get more than one person leading your Bible studies. The person who learns the most is the person who leads the Bible study. And believe me, you want to share that wealth. So um, this is a good place to start to have everybody look at and see, well, what, which one of the topics I want to talk about. And it gives you a summary of all of the um, scriptures that are included and all of those things. Now, if you skip over to page 103 in your book, down at the bottom of that page, you will see the future PW Horizon Bible studies. So the um, Bible study for next year, the working title is Finding Resilience, Joy, and Our Identity in Jesus Christ. And if you turn over to page 105 down at the bottom, there's another place for scheduling. So if you're sharing, um, facilitating your, your Bible studies, this is a good place to put who's doing which lesson, at, you know. Uh, 106 and 107 gives you the annotated bibliography. And then if you look at the back page, it's got a calendar for 2024 and 2025. And it's always amazing to me how in our Bible studies, we're needing a calendar. So that's a good place to look. Then if you look on the very back of the um, book, down at the bottom, you'll see which lessons are included in which one of the horizon um, uh, studies. Okay, so go back to page 10, and that's our introduction. And I would argue that Christians should probably be the most concerned about the environment than just about anybody um, else in the world. And the reason I say that is for three reasons. We all know God created the world. We all know that God entrusted us to be the good stewards and caretakers of what he created. And we also know that God gave us the earth on loan. And one of the things that um, the late evangelist Billy Graham said was, when we see the world as a gift from God, we will do our best to take care of it and use it wisely instead of poisoning or destroying it. So our study begins on page 10 by our author giving a whole bunch of quotes from the Old Testament that talk about justice and uh, justice for society's least powerful people. And one of the earliest prophets was Amos. And so the title of our study comes from a verse that's in the book of Amos. It's from Amos 5, 4, uh, 24. And if you look on the top of the right column of page 10, you'll see it says, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And what Amos was talking about before he says that verse is he's talking about how the powerful and wealthy people are taking advantage of the poor and unpowerful people. And he's also talking about how they're worshiping idols and they're doing very horrible things. They are not living the way God told them to live. And one of the things he says in there is that the weak had no voice at the gate. Okay, so when a, a city or a town, when they um, are built, they have a wall around to protect them. And so there's a gate to get into the, the city or the town. 
Now, like Jerusalem, I think has five gates, but most towns are just going to have like one gate. So the gate was a very important place for that town. That's where they held court. That's where uh, major business um, transactions took place. And it's also where they made public announcements. So when they're talking about how the poor have no voice at the gate, what they're talking about is the poor have no voice in court. And what would often happen is the rich people would pay witnesses to say that um, the poor person owed them money or something like that. And as long as there's two witnesses, then the court says that's the gospel truth. And so um, a lot of times the rich people would steal from the poor people by doing something as bribing witnesses to come and say something in court. And those who were godly and righteous, they feared uh, retribution. So they didn't say anything or they might have thought, well, even if I say anything, nothing will happen. So a lot of times they just let it go. So Amos was warning the Israelites that if they don't transform their corrupt courts and establish justice and righteousness, if they didn't have justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, then the people were going to be taken over by the Assyrians, which they were. So our author then takes that idea and talks about justice with the environment. So I have a description of what justice is. Justice is what is right, fair, and impartial. And I'll probably say that half a dozen times or more as we go through this overview. <laughs> so as we stated earlier, the creation, the creation story tells us how God created humans to take care of his creation. So I've highlighted two um, Genesis passages that kind of talk about that. Genesis 1, 26 and 2, 15. And because of our special place, humans are called to protect and preserve the creation. In other words, we're the keepers of our creation. We're the stewards of creation. So literally from the first book of the Bible, it starts telling us how we're supposed to take care of God's creation. So as we go through our lessons, I want you to think about that, but I also want you to think about something else. The Bible always has two meanings for everything they talk about. And what I mean by that is like when God said to King David, your son will build the temple. He was talking about in the Old Testament, his son Solomon will build the temple, but he's also talking about a descendant of David in the New Testament is going to build the temple for all of us, Jesus Christ. So as we go through things and you see things, um, think of the symbolism of the Old Testament meaning and then also the New Testament meaning. So as I was going through this study, I kept going back to that idea that was our theme for 2023 PW Spring Gathering. And it was, we are stewards over God's creation. And the reason why we chose that is because the Spring Gathering was held on Earth Day. So that was the thing that kind of helped me um, as I was trying to put together some lesson plans uh, for you guys. Also, I love videos. So I'm going to have a ton of videos in, this, um, in these PowerPoint slides. Uh, sometimes I like one video over another. So I put a red asterisk by some things. Most of the time, I like all of them and, and I don't really care. It's whatever you want to do. But the first one I like here, stewardship, the water parable. The reason I like it because it explains stewardship. And because we're talking about we are stewards of God's creation, you need to have everybody on the same page as to what exactly is our role as a steward. And so this takes like a bucket of water and it kind of uses that idea to explain stewardship. So I really liked that one. 
The second one, does the gospel have anything to do with creation care? Uh, it's five minutes and 12 seconds is what it says, but stop it at four minutes and 12 seconds because the last minute is an advertisement for the um, group that, that put it together. And the third one, care for God's creation, that's um, by the Catholic church that put that one together. And the fourth one, the Mormon church put it together, our earth, our home, God created the earth for us to enjoy and take care of. All right, so let's get into the lessons. I found it very interesting that a Horizon Bible study does not have opening prayers. Yeah. So in the every single lesson, you will not find an opening prayer at the beginning of each of the lessons. You will find suggestions for opening prayers, though, back in the suggestions for leaders. So if you look back at page 20 and you look in the left column about halfway down, it says the prayer. And in this particular one, it says to do this three times, but I would do it just one time. But I really like um, this prayer because it, it gets us to thinking all of these different things. And it goes like this. God be in my thinking. I get, God be in my listening. Be in my speaking. Be in my feelings. And be in my actions. And showing your hands out. And think about it. That's a great way of us thinking about justice. You want God in your thinking, in your listening, in your speaking, in your feelings, and in your actions. So I like that prayer quite a bit. Now then, if you'll go back to page 13. Um, again, I have a video. And I like the um, this video. Why should we care for God's creation? I would probably stop the video at 158 instead of going through the entire two minutes and 11 seconds because that last uh, bit is um, an advertisement. And then you could always follow into a discussion of why everyone should care about God's creation. So I added in some... Um, several different Bible scriptures in each one of the lessons. And one of them I've added in is the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And the parable of the talents, it talks about how um, a master is going off on a trip and he has three servants or stewards. And the first one, he gives five talents. The second one, he gives two talents. And the third one, he gives one talent. And the first two understand the spirit and the letter of instructions that the master gives to them. And so they go and they use their resources of trading and gaining a profit. So they end up where the first one had five talents, he makes another five talents, so he has 10 talents. And the second one has two talents and they make a profit and they have four talents. And when the master comes back, they come and they give those talents to the um, master. And when that the master gets those talents, he um, praises them, he gives them additional responsibilities and he invites them to join with him in, in his joy. Now the third um, servant who was given one talent, he was, he feared the master. He did not understand what the master was trying to get him to do. And so instead of, of doing anything with it, he went and buried it. And then when the master returned, he took it out and he gave that one talent back to the master. And the master, he scolded him and he said, even if you were scared of doing something with that talent, you should have at least put it in the bank so it would have made interest. So he scolded him, he rejected him, he punished him. So as Christians, being faithful stewards, God is giving us time and our talents and our finances. And he wants us to be like those first two stewards. He wants us to take those uh, resources 
and have a heart of service and to use those resources to take care of God's creation and to take care of other people. He wants us to use those um, resources responsibly. He doesn't want us to be like that third servant. He doesn't want us to hide our resources and not use them. So as responsible um, stewards, we've been entrusted to take good care of our environment. And we want to do that, but we don't want to hide. We want to take good care like what we would take care of our home. And then if you look down at the bottom of page 13, you see Ezekiel's metaphor. And basically our scriptures, Ezekiel 33, 21, 34, 8, 17, and then 18 through 19. That's where she's kind of explaining all of those scriptures on page 13. And then it goes on over to page 14. The main point for um, Ezekiel, it wasn't that the power of the other countries that were coming to conquer Judah were the problem. Ezekiel was basically saying the problem was the leaders of Judah. They had failed the country and they were weakening the country. And so one of the things that she uses is if you look at the bottom middle column of page 14, and then it goes up to the top of the right column on page 14. She uses Ezekiel 34, 18 through 19. And I'm not going to read it, but basically if you look at the very end of that um, scripture, it, it says author's translation in italics. So what our author did is she um, replaced words so instead of saying trample or trampled, she said tread and trodden. And instead of, or I'm sorry, instead of tread and trodden, she used trample and trampled. And instead of foul or fouled, she used pollute or polluted. I'm not really sure why she changed that, but I want you to just take note that she did change the uh, scripture in there. To me, it doesn't really change the meaning. And then if you look back at the suggestions for leaders on page 20, under engaging the text, there's a section there that you may want to ask some of those discussion questions that she's included in that area. All right. Okay, I went the wrong way. Let's see if I can go back up. There we go. So most of the rest of the uh, lesson talks about env environmental justice. And if you look on page 16, our author has a translation in the box there. And she says, um, environmental justice is the fair treatment of all people without distinction. And then if you look straight across from there um, to the left, down at the very bottom of that a paragraph, it says, nobody wants polluters nearby and nobody should have to tolerate them. Wholeheartedly agree with that particular statement. Um, but I want to kind of go through and give you a little bit of um, idea of where the world was at that particular time. Because most of the things that she talks about in the book these are things that were created in the 1950s, 60s, and the early 70s. And there were no regulations at all in the United States. It wasn't until uh, 1970 that President Richard Nixon created EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And in 1980, when President Jimmy Carter created CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, and that was the one that took care of the super um, um, Superfund program and the, the uh, cleanup of the hazardous material sites. And then in 1990 is when George H.W. Bush created the Clean Air Act, and that was the one that took care of acid rain, urban air pollution, toxic air emissions, and stratospheric ozone depletion. 
So before that, there were no regulations at all. And when the sites were created, when chemical plants and refineries and pipelines and all of those different places were created, manufacturing companies, they usually needed large areas and they usually went to unpopulated unpopul places. But as the years went by, cities grew up around them and people moved closer to them. So we need to remember those things as we're uh, reading through some of these different items. We also need to remember that we need to balance our development and our conservation, and that there's no reason to villainize either group. And so I, I wanted to kind of go back and look for myself because I mean, think about when Hurricane Barrel happened and uh, like the people in my neighborhood didn't have electricity for one week and it was say 96 degrees and we needed that air conditioning. And we really missed our electricity. And so uh, when we stop, okay, whoever isn't muted, if you would try to mute yourself, I would appreciate it. Um, and then, so also think about uh, the reason why our cars are now able to get more miles per gallon is because we have plastics that have replaced the metal and the glass in our cars. And also like um, our underground pipelines are now plastic because we don't have to do as much maintenance and uh, we don't have to replace them as often. So there's good reasons to have development, but we also need to be aware of some of the things that happen or that may um, occur. And a lot of times we don't know that there's going to be something that's going to be bad that happens until many years later. Also, the average growth rate from 10,000 BC, so that's before, since the beginning of time, to 1700, the growth rate was 0.04%. So basically, people were dying as much as people were being born. And in the last three centuries, the life expectancy has gone from being 30 years old to 80 years old. And there's really three reasons for that. And that's because of the cures that we have uh, created. We found um, those cures for the once fatal diseases. Think about the plague back in, I think it was 1200, something like that, where one third of Europe died. Now we have cures for those things. Also from 1700 to now, we have a 450% increase in farm production. And if you look at the most um, developed area of 1700, Western Europe, there were usually seven famines every century. And those seven famines usually lasted a total of 10 years. So one tenth of a century was in famine time. And also the average Western uh, European family in 1700, they lived in a hut, with little or no furniture, no change of clothing, barely enough food to eat to endure a few hours of agricultural labor per day. They also didn't have electricity or plumbing or water or, or sewage treatment or any of those other things. And today we have all of those amenities in our homes and we have to worry more about obesity than about um, the famines. I'm not gonna make any um, comments on the different things that she has talked about as examples in our different lessons, except for this one. I just wanna explain a couple of things. Um, sometimes she will give examples, but she doesn't give you all of the stuff that was around those examples. So I'm gonna just tell about this particular one. So she gives the example of Three Mile Island. Uh, it was a nuclear melt meltdown that was in Pennsylvania, and it was just southeast of Harrisburg, which is the capital of Pennsylvania. And 12 days before this meltdown, the hit mu movie China Syndrome came out. And if you remember the movie China Syndrome, it's about a nuclear meltdown. And so... Um, 
everybody was like, oh no, we're gonna, everything's gonna happen just like what happened in the movie. And so all of the news people were concerned about that. Plus Three Mile Island is close to huge um, news areas like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Washington DC and New York City. And so they were concerned about those particular things. But what we they found out from that movie and from Three Mile Island is that could not happen the way the, the movie said it would happen. So when the uranium spill in New Mexico happened about four and a half months later, this was over in the desert. There is no major news place around it. Plus, what was going on at that particular time? The Skylab station crashed and everybody was focused on that. So as we know, the news reporters were not, they, they focus on what they're interested in and that's where how we get our news. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of page 17, Ezekiel's metaphor in our day, it's not the chemical plants and the pipelines and the refineries and the landfills that we have to worry about. It's the people who are leading those things that we have to worry about. And so our author kind of talks about that in that section. But it isn't just the leaders. We can all improve by doing what is right and fair and impartial. And I really thought that Trisha missed um, uh, a real thing that she could have focused on that all of us could relate to, and that was littering. So if you look at that picture in the top right corner, that picture is gum on a sidewalk. We see it everywhere. We see it in our parking lots, our sidewalks, everywhere. And it's not leaders that did that. That is people like you and me who put that gum down there. I went to the um, store yesterday and I was going from my car to the store and in the parking lot, I happened to be looking down and somebody had just dropped some gum down on the, the sidewalk. And I'm like, ah, because here was the sun melting it and it was going all over the place. But it's the little things that we can do. And so that's where I think I would focus my attention on for this particular section. So I've got four videos that I've included here. The first one is the impact of littering on the environment and how you can help. And that was put together by the city of Kansas City. The second one is impacts of litter within our community. And that was put together by Great Lakes. Um, I would start it at the 48 seconds and end it at seven minutes. Um, it does have some good ideas about recycling and stuff that I, I got from there. The third one is the cost of littering and it was put together by Richmond, Virginia. And the fourth one is my favorite one. That's Willie Nelson's Don't Mess With Texas campaign. And it's only 30 seconds. And you might remember it. It's where um, it's going down the highway and there's this ball of, of trash that keeps going and going and going and getting bigger and bigger. And it goes to um, Austin right in front of the Capitol building. Um, I kind of like that one. And then I'm leaving you with a quote here from C.S. Lewis. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. So let justice roll down. Lesson two talks about land justice. Um, an alternative suggestion to the one included in the suggestion for leaders for the opening prayer may be Psalm, um, I'll hit here, Psalm 24, one through two, which is one of our scripture passages that she's included for this lesson. Remember, Psalms is a book of songs and prayers. And so whenever you have a Psalm as one of the um, scriptures, you might use that as, as one of your prayers. Another one is, is like verse one of all good gifts or verse one of this is my father's world. And I have words to those included on each on uh, my notes page. There are lots of ways that you could start this one. I, I really kind of like this lesson a lot. I like this one and I like the food one. 
but I would probably start over on, on page 24 where it says land meet, means survival. Genesis 2, 7, um, it says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So the word dust of the ground in Hebrew is humus. So it means soil. And it's the root word for the um, word human. So one of the things I would suggest doing is getting a bowl of dirt and putting it in front of people and have those people look at this bowl of dirt and imagine how God created dirt into a heart pumping blood through our entire body or lungs that could breathe air or brain that can think and speak and all of that. And then you might wanna do a play on words and serve hummus since humus is so close to the word hummus and hummus um, have it served with things that come from the land like carrot sticks and celery sticks or pita bread or pita chips or something like that. And at the back, or at the end of each one of the lessons, there are some questions. You might want to include um, question one there on page 28. It talks about what difference does it make to view ourselves as having been shaped by God from the ground itself and having been directed to serve and preserve that ground. Then in the suggestions for leaders, it says, um, visualize your favorite landscape. And I think that's a great thing to do. I mean, have people stop and think, what is it that, um, why is it your favorite landscape? What is it that makes you so comfortable in that landscape? And, you know, have them stop and, and think, what they like about that particular area. And then you might get into a discussion about promised land. Promised land is a very important theme throughout the Bible. And the promised land is not that strip of, of land in the Middle East. Promised land means much more than just that. Remember, God gave Adam and Eve the Garden of Eden which is a land. And the reason he gave that land is so that they would dwell with him as his people and enjoy his presence. But the humans couldn't do two things. They couldn't trust God and they couldn't follow his instructions. And so this becomes a very um, familiar theme throughout the Bible. Humans rebelling against God and it's all because of their sinfulness and their self selfishness. And then God banishes them from that land. So uh, there's two stories that are talked about in this lesson. One is uh, Joshua uh, with the Israelites destroying Jericho. And the other one is the Jubilee law. And by the way, uh, Leviticus 25 that she's talking about. Um, it's, it says, for the land is mine, with me you are but aliens and tenants, meaning that God could withdraw his protection and allow Israel to become like landless foreigners if they um, broke his covenant. Okay, so let's talk about Joshua and Israelites destroying Jericho. If you look on page 24, our author says near the bottom um, of the, the right-hand column, it, she says the deep connection between land and survival, um, it really brings that home. And that's true. There is a very deep connection between the land as a place where God dwells with his people. And we also need to understand something about the Bible. It's just one big interconnected story. So as I talked about before, the Garden of Eden is a land to dwell with God and be in his presence. And then Adam and Eve, they sin and God cast them out. And then God promised uh, Abraham that he would give this land to him and his people 
but they would have to wait 400 years later. And remember um, Jacob, who's also called Israel, he and his 12 sons, they leave Canaan and they go over to Egypt because there is a famine. And so the Israelites, they go over there and then the Egyptians take them into um, a slavery. And so then there's the idea of the promised land. And then you have the picture of the covenant and the faithfulness and how you have to follow that simple instruction of trust God and follow his commands. So then when Moses uh, takes the people across the Red Sea and he has them there just before going into the promised land, he sends 12 spies out there. And remember, 10 of those 12 come back and they say, there's no way we can conquer this land because these people are giants. And they say, yeah, it is the land of milk and honey, but I just don't think we can, can conquer this land. And only two people thought that they could, that God would, would take them through and lead them into victory. And remember, that's why the people had to wander the wilderness for 40 years. And they had to wait for all of those people who had built the golden calf and had not believed in him, had they had died. And also the people had to learn to trust God and to follow his commands. So the, by the time of Joshua and the Israelites going over into Canaan, they learned, learned that they had to follow God's commands. So I also want to explain a few facts about the Canaanites. Um, if you look up at the top of page 24 of your book, our author says, God is depicted as a violent deity commanding genocide of the Canaanites. I have a real problem with that statement, but anyway. Um, we need to remember that ancient Palestine region was constantly under battle. This is an area that um, was, it was great for coming in from the Mediterranean Sea and also for invasion routes. And so you have the Egyptians on one side and you have people over in Asia Minor and Mesopotamia, and then also on the other side of the Mediterranean. And all of these people want this great um, natural trade route. And so there were about, I think it was seven different groups in the 500 years before Joshua and the Israelites came to Canaan that those people in Canaan were under war. And throughout the entire Torah, and remember the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Throughout the entire Torah, the Canaanites are told as, are, are called as not innocent people. And in fact, in Exodus 23, 23, God told Moses, he would blot out the Canaanites. And he could have done it in a number of ways. He could have had a famine. He could have had an earthquake. But he chose Joshua and the Israelites. The Canaanites, they knew about God. Remember, where did uh, Jacob and his 12 sons come from? But from Canaan. So they knew about God. But they decided that they wanted to worship foreign gods. And they also were very immoral and very wicked. They believed in child sacrificing. They believed in incest. They believed in adultery. They believed in temple pro prostitution. And they had lots of other horrible acts that they did. So we know, remember when the spies go over and they um, are talking with Rahab and Rahab tells them, our people know about your God. And he, uh, she also says, our people know everything your God has done for you. So the Canaanites were not ignorant of God. And God will always give people a chance to switch over, just like he did with Rahab and her family. And remember, Rahab and her family survived. The rest of the people of Jericho did not. 
also in De Deuteronomy 20, 17 through 18, and some other of the uh, passages over in the Torah, God tells how holiness cannot coexist with sin. And so that is one of the things that he tells that um, it's not just the Canaanites, but the Hittites, the Amorites, the per Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites were all people that God said need to go because God's holiness cannot exist with their sin. Also, the entire Canaanites were not destroyed. The Canaanites that were part of Jericho were destroyed, but the whole Canaanites were not destroyed. In fact, it mentions them several times in Deuteronomy. And I think the main thing that Trisha did omit from this lesson is that God sees the end from the beginning. And we always have to remember that. So on the Jubilee Law, uh, the Leviticus 25 verses that she talks about um, talk about the Jubilee Law, but there's also verses in Deuteronomy. Um, the first part of Leviticus 25 tells where God told Moses instructions for the land. And so basically, it's kind of like um, the same as with the week, how we work for six days, but on the seventh day we rest. Well, it's the same thing with the plant fields. You work the plant fields for six years and you let them rest for the seventh year. And we still do that today. We rotate our crops around to uh, give the soil rest so that they can have more nutrients and everything. And God also tells Moses in that sixth year, I will give you enough food or enough crops to last you both the sixth year and the seventh year. Okay, one of the things you need to remember is when they were wandering the wilderness for 40 years, they were getting manna. And remember, God told them on the, the sixth day, I will give you enough manna for that sixth day as well as the seventh day. So on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, you will rest and you cannot, you don't have to work. Okay, and if you try to... Um, save too much too much food on, on the other days, it would spoil. Okay, it's the same type of thing as what this was. So the seven year period is called a sabbatical year. So then the Jubilee would be after seven sabbatical years. So remember on the sixth year, you get two years crops. So on a, the Jubilee, the seventh sabbatical year on the 48th, uh, year, you would get three years crops. So that would be for the 48th, the 49th, and then the 50th. And on that 50th year, what you were supposed to do that entire year, only thing you're supposed to do is just worship God. Um, we have no proof that they ever practice Jubilee. We have lots of proof that they did practice sabbatical years. So maybe they did, uh, maybe they didn't. We just don't really know. One of the things that you um, also need to remember is that in Leviticus 25, 23, God reminds them of the fact that the land is actually his. And the people are his too. And he also reminds them that he took them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And he never wanted them to be enslaved again by their people. He wanted them to have compassion on God's people. And so one of the things he talks about in 2535 is their responsibility to their kin. So you can you can charge interest um, to a foreigner, but you are not supposed to charge interest to your kin. You are not supposed to make profit off of anything um, when you are lending money out to your kin. Also, the idea of forgiveness of debt, because um, what you need to remember is that the debt is already paid. It wasn't a, a forgiveness of debt. What it was, it was, was basically loaning your land out to somebody that was giving you money. So let's say um, it's five years to the sabbatical year, the seventh year and say you owed $250 to an individual, you would loan your land out for them to lease it 
for $50 a year for those five years. So you're not actually getting any money, but they're using the land and then they get to take those crops and make a profit from those crops that they are getting. And maybe there was only two years before the sabbatical year. And so it wouldn't meet all of your um, debt. So you may actually be like an indentured servant and do your servanthood uh, working for them to pay for the rest of it. So that's what it's talking about. It doesn't forgive um, a debt and, and have like land sold to somebody else. The land never actually is redistributed. What it um, basically God was wanting to do is he gave each of the, the tribes property and he wanted that land to stay within that tribe. And so therefore uh, he was just making sure that the a land would go back to the original owner. So it stayed within that. It doesn't mean you did, you couldn't buy land or houses or whatever, but it meant that they were supposed to keep it within that tribe. Of course, we know that didn't actually happen, that they started doing other things, but that was basically what was happening. Also, Jubilee laws did not apply to foreigners. So just remember that that was only for the Israelites. Okay, so let's go on to lesson three. This is a, a favorite one of mine too. Um, I was reading on the internet about food and it said that people eat 16 times their weight and that horses eat eight times their weight in a year. So I'm thinking we should eat like a horse and eat half of what we should be eating or, or what we are currently eating. Um, throughout the Bible, food plays a very important role. Uh, think about it. The very first thing that God says to humans is he, he invites them to eat of the plants and the fruits of the Garden of Eden. And the first thing that um, the first sin is, is from them eating the, from the tree of knowledge. And one of the last acts that Jesus does with his disciples is he has the last supper. And then if you go back to Revelation, the final vision of the new world is this massive joyful banquet. So food is something that is very important throughout the entire Bible. But probably one of the most important um, individuals that is associated with food is Jesus. His very first a miracle that he did is he changed water into wine. And think about how many times he would go and meet with people around the dinner table. He was constantly um, being invited, well, by the Pharisees to try to, to trick him, but also people who he helped, he would be invited into their homes. And sometimes he was the host. Think of the feeding of the 5,000. Or think about when he was resurrected. Remember, um, the disciples were in the fishing boat and he was over on the shore and he was cooking fish and he invited them to come over for breakfast. Um, also, remember when he was going down the um, street of Emmaus and, and the people who he was walking with, they didn't know who he was until they invited him to their house and he broke the bread. And all of a sudden they realized it was Jesus that was with them. So often food is used as symbols in the Bible. And one of the symbols of Jesus is he um, says that he is the bread of life. And think about that. Um, God's life-sustaining provision was bread and water and the spiritual uh, sustaining life of, of um, our spirit is Jesus. And so those two things kind of go together. Even though there are 12 different scriptures that are put in this uh, lesson, there's really only three stories. One is the rich garden God created. One is the manna story. And then there's the parable of the sower. But before we get into those scriptures, I kind of want to put in um, context, all of this bit about land. 
So I found this Apple land use model in several different places on the internet. So if the apple is the earth, three fourths of the earth is covered by water. One fourth of it is land. So one twelfth is unhabitable land. It's deserts, it's mountains, it's polar regions. And one twelfth of it is habitable land, but it's not for agricultural use. It's nature preserves and it's public land. It's um, areas that have been developed like roads and schools and houses and all of those different things. So that leaves us one twelfth. Three fourths, three forty eighths of that is land for livestock grazing and crops to feed livestock. So one forty eighth of the land is used for crops for humans to eat. I find that fascinating. Another thing I wanted to share with you is some facts that I found about agriculture and food. So there are 1.9 million farms in America. 95% of them are operated by families or uh, family partnerships or family corporations. So family farms and ranches account for 90% of the total production value. And one U.S. farm feeds 166 people per year in the U.S. and abroad. Now, then, if you looked at 1962, one farmer fed 25.8 persons per year. Okay, then according to the Soil and Crop Sciences of Texas A&M, on average, we get 160 bushels of corn per acre. In 1950, we only got 40 bushels of corn per acre. And about 40% of our corn is used for biofuels usage like ethanol. So 20% of the US farm products are exported each year, except for last year, it was only 10%. And then the last two things are just absolutely mind boggling to me. Americans throw away 25% of the food that they purchase for their home. So say you didn't eat all the, the things that are um, uh, on your plate, you would throw that away. Or if something spoils, you would throw that away. So that's like 25%. But this one's the most unbearable thing for me to, to think of. 30 to 40% of all food grown and produced in the U.S. is never eaten. Think about when you're manufacturing and they're going through and they're like pulling things out. Oh, that's not good enough for our product. Or you um, have the food waste in the stores. Um, they put all of the, the vegetables out and, and somebody doesn't buy those vegetables by the time that they should be taking them off the, the shelf. So they have to throw those things away. Or in, in restaurants, um, they make too much food and so they have to throw some of that away or people only eat half of what's on their plate and so they're throwing that away. And so that would be 30 to 40% of all of our food that is wasted. So some ideas that you might wanna do for this lesson. I gave you a handout of um, some biblical foods, list of biblical foods. So you might wanna serve some biblical foods. And then in the suggestions for leaders, she says um, the opening prayer might be taking one of your favorite graces as our opening prayer. And that's, that's a great idea. In that same place, um, in the suggestions for leaders, it includes a question, how does sharing food connect us to God and help us draw closer to each other and our food? And then that, this might be a good place to share some of those things that I talked about um, two slides ago. Um, about how Jesus was always at a, a, a meal sharing his scripture or sharing his beliefs and teachings and things. And if you look on page 33 and then over to 34, um, this is a, a section is called Abundance in Nature. And this section is basically where our author describes some of the scriptures that she's included in the lesson. And the passages show 
how the people were dependent upon God for their daily bread. And it also opens up a discussion of what happens when you don't follow God's commandments and want more. Um, since one of the scriptures is about the um, parable of the sower, I always get a lot of questions about that. And I found this video and it's from gotquestions.org. And it really is very good at explaining it. And remember the parable of the sower is where it talks about how there's four different types of soil and the uh, planter is throwing seeds out onto the four different types of soils and which ones grow and which ones don't grow. And so that might be a good one uh, to go look at is, is that video. There are lots of scriptures that you can um, bring into the discussion that talk about feeding the poor and helping people in need. But one of the ones that I like is Matthew 25, 34 through 40. And that's the one, you know, where Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And the disciples say, when did we do that? And he says, whenever you do it to the least of, me, of my children, then you do it to me too. Okay, that's basically the same thing. Um, another thing you might want to bring into that discussion is that quote, if you give a man a fish, he you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And finally, you may want to ask your ladies to bring in like a jar of peanut butter or jelly or any type of, of food donation and then donate those items to a food pantry. Lesson four, that this one is on water justice. And water is so important in the Bible that it is mentioned 722 times. That is more than faith, hope, prayer, or worship. So we know water is important to us physically, but we also know from creation to salvation, water represents things like cleansing and renewal and God's presence or the spirit of God. And so water symbolizes new life and rebirth too. So some suggestions you might wanna do. I've got two, um, videos here. They're actually black video. Uh, the screen is black. It's just the, the sound of rain. And as people come in, you may want to have rain um, playing so that they start thinking about water. But the one I like the most is this third one. It's a choir making the sounds of a rainstorm. And you may have seen um, on America's Got Talent, there was a choir from LA, I believe, and they came in and they started rubbing their hands together and then they started uh, snapping their fingers and then they started patting their legs and then stomping on the ground. And, and they did it kind of um, one side and then going to the other side and then going back down to where it was just sprinkling. And then they go into a song. Well, this video, it does just the part where the choir is making the sounds of rain. And so that's a good way to kind of introduce the water justice lesson. Um, let's see here. If you go to both the study book as well as engaging the text uh, in page 52, on page 52 of the suggestions of leaders, it tells you how water is a blessing as well as a source of danger. Think about it. In Genesis 1, it tells us how the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. The water is there at the very beginning. And then when you talk about in Genesis 2, it tells you how water aids land to be fertile and to be productive. And then in Genesis 6 through 9, it talks about the flood with Noah. And so the only people who survived were those who followed God's commandment. But there's lots of scriptures that talk about water. And you may ask people, can you think of any? And if people can't uh, figure out any type of scriptures with uh, about water, I've listed 13 of them in my notes. 
So just go to this slide and you will see 13 different um, stories that include water. And basically these Bible stories, they serve as reminder of our need for godly guidance, cleansing and renewal. And so you might wanna go through and ask them, um, you know, which one of, of these items does this water story represent to you? Then Psalm 95, five, it says, the sea is his for he made it and the dry land which his hands have formed. So just like the land belongs to God, the seas belong to God too. And so as stewards, we are supposed to take care of the water on the earth. Now, author um, Bill Peel, he wrote about stewardship. And one of the quotes I took from his book was, owners have rights, stewards have responsibilities. And so that's always good to talk about our responsibilities towards the water of the earth. So I've included another video. I told you I love videos. And this one's about marine pollution. Um, at the very end of the video, it asks the question, how can we clean up our waste? So you might wanna have a discussion of what are things that we can do to clean up our waste in the waters. Now, according to the United Nations, uh, in a report that was released in March, 2023, 25% of the world so 2.5 million people, I'm sorry, 2 million, 2 billion people um, have no access to clean water. And 46% of the world population lacks adequate sanitation services. So you may wanna do a clean water experiment. And I gave you a handout in the email and it, kind of takes you through there and it lets the ladies work together to create a filter. So you might have things like rocks and um, coffee filters and hose and um, sand and I don't know, whatever you want to pull from your house. And let those people use trial and error to find the best way of getting some dirty water and having it pour through the filters and try to get it as clean as possible. But always remind people, no matter how clean it looks, they cannot drink that water. And then you may wanna end with uh, something from the suggestions for leaders on page 53 under the commitment title. And it talks about getting some water soluble paper and writing uh, things that you would like for God to help you with um, on water problems. And water soluble paper, you can get it online from Amazon and Walmart and Joann's. Sometimes you can find it in the stores. Um, you can also, if you're here in Houston, you can find it at Texas Art Supply. But what happens is when you put that water uh, soluble paper into a cup and then pour water over it and stir it around, it will dissolve. So lesson five is on air quality. So what I would do with this one is hand out balloons to every single person and ask people to stop and think about air. We need air in our bodies. We need that oxygen to help with everything in our, our body's function. And without air, we would be dead. So have them blow up a balloon and have them kind of look at it and, and have them blow the air out of the balloon and blow it back up again. And what does air look like? And can you see air? And we may not be able to see air, but we can definitely see what air can do to things. So you may even wanna have straws and use straws to blow things or have a hair dryer. Um, you could have a hair dryer with a ping pong ball and show how the ping pong ball can stay up in the air because the hair dryer is keeping it up. Um, we can see what the wind does. We can see the limbs go back and forth. We can see ripples in water, but 
you know, it's not like we can actually see when, but we can see what when does. And sometimes we can even see, or we can hear air. So like if you have a balloon, you can hold it real tight and the air will make noise coming out of the balloon. So the Bible is full of symbolism and deeper meanings using air and wind and breath and tying that all together with the Holy Spirit. So this ties together with the um, things that our author has told us in the main idea. The wind itself often signals a holy moment and is related to both our breath and God's, both our spirit and God's. So for the opening prayer, you want to uh, may want to do something like read the lyric, first lyric from Breathe on Me, Breath of God or Spirit of the Living God. And then on page 56 and 57, um, under the section titled, Air is Sacred, our author talks about the scriptures for lesson five. And in there, she talks about Genesis 2-7. Um, it wasn't until God breathed life into humans that they became a living be being and they had a living soul. So just as our air sustains our physical body, it's also the presence of God in our lives. And Genesis 1.30, that's where um, it tells about how God also breathed into creatures, not just to humans. And then in Genesis 1-2, which we talked about a little bit before, it talks about the wind or the spirit of God. And the spirit of God or the wind, it, that's the Hebrew word ruach that is used. And every single one of the scriptures that she has included, um, they use that word ruach. And so you may want to take that and link it. Well, I'll talk about it in just a second. And then in the blue letter Bible, it compared wind to the Holy Spirit and it gave five reasons why you compare wind and the Holy Spirit. And for one thing, it was uh, the wind is invisible. We know it's there, but we cannot see it. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. We know that the Spirit of God is there working, but we, we don't see him. We don't see the Holy Spirit. The second thing is though the wind is invisible, we can see and feel the results of it. Again, go back to Hurricane Barrel. You can see and feel that wind when it was blowing through. In the same manner, think of the Holy Spirit. Think of Pentecost. Um, also, Genesis 1, 2 uh, tells us about that Holy Spirit is involved in creating the heavens and the earth. Also, the wind is unexplainable. We do not understand where uh, wind comes from, and we do not know where wind goes. And it's likewise the work of the Holy Spirit, who is God, and we just don't, ex we can't explain it. And finally, the wind blows where it wishes, it does not go where someone guides it. And the same is with the Holy Spirit. It does what he wills. Okay, so I was telling you about the word ruach. And if you look on page 56, our author spends quite a bit of time talking about the word ruach. And ruach means breath, wind, or spirit. So every single one of these verses, Genesis 6, 17, 7, 7, uh, 15, and then 22, that's part of the flood story. It is used to mean breath of life to characterize living things. And then Ezekiel 37, 5, 8, and 10, that is God causes breath to enter the dry bones and bring them to life. And Ezekiel 11, 5, Psalm 32, 2, that signifies the spirit of uh, God coming and the humans. And Job 7, 11, that describes the pain of his own spirit. And Psalm 104, 29, this verse talks about the cycle of life and death. And when God takes away his breath or spirit from creatures, they die and return to dust. And then Isaiah 42, 5, God's breath and spirit 
um, go to everyone who walks on earth. So those are some of the summaries I have in my notes, and it talks about those that um, she includes in the scripture. So the word ruach was found 400 times in the Old Testament. So God's ruach is the source of life. And one of the verses, Isaiah 42, 1, it talks about how um, the Messiah will be power, powered by the Holy Spirit. And then if you go to Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus is baptized, we see that the uh, that scripture from Isaiah 42, 1 happens. That's where the, the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove and lights on him. So you may want to go to page 64 in the suggestions for leaders under engaging the world. And there it talks about this activity of uh, going to the EPA page and uh, getting this page called, What Can You Do? So I've included that in one of your handouts that I sent to you. And so you might look at that and see what you can do. And again, I like uh, children's books. Sometimes I like to read a part of a children's book or even maybe the whole book to bring home a point either in the beginning of a lesson or the end of the lesson. And usually it's at the end of the lesson. And so I've included this one, Every Breath We Take. And, and this one, um, the foreword of it, it's by Julianne Moore, who's the actress. And this book explores um, air through touch and smell and sound and sight. And it underscores the importance of clean air to all life on earth. Okay, the next one is lesson six, climate change. Um, okay, I went back to five. Why did it do that? There we go. Um, I like the way the suggestion for leaders has the opening prayer as the Lord's prayer. I thought that was a great one. And one of the things that she suggests in um, on that page is inviting the group to focus on the phrase on earth as it is in heaven. And then following up the prayer by asking what they imagine heaven to be like. And then does our image inform us of how we should act on earth? So there's also a children's book here um, that it's called, I Can Only Imagine. And when you think about what do you imagine heaven is like, you may wanna go to this book, I Can Only Imagine by Bart Millard. And it's the same man who wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine. And what this book does is it asks questions that many kids have about God and heaven. So you may just wanna pick out a few of those. So according to the main idea for this lesson, scripture teaches us to listen to prophets who warn of threats, avoid complacency and self-concern and participate with joy in the work God has given us to do. So our author uses Jeremiah 37, 11 through 16 as that passage to talk about a prophet warning of a threat. So Jeremiah had a prophecy um, a career of prophesizing for 40 years. And he was prophesizing about how they needed to change their ways in Judah. Otherwise the Chaldeans or the Babylonians as they're also called um, would come and conquer them. And so now the Babylonians are coming to conquer Judah and they're just outside and the people of Judah are still sitting there telling Jeremiah that um, he doesn't know what he's talking about, that God will, will uh, keep them safe. And they start beating him to death and they throw him into a pit and they do all these different things. But Jeremiah still has to share that message that God gave him to share. So you may have a discussion about how to share a message that God compels you to share. Another one of the um, passages is Luke 12, 16 through 21. 
And this is the parable of the rich fool. And this is where Jesus is warning against selfishness and greed. And talking about how all of our treasures on earth are temporary and that you need to put God first. And there's a Roman proverb that says, money is like seawater. The more a man drinks, the thirstier he becomes. And so as long as a man's attitude is that, a, that of the rich fool, he'll keep wanting to have more and more and more. And basically that's the reverse of the Christian way of doing things. So you may have a discussion about that. Isaiah 22, 13, uh, this passage, it follows the same idea as the Luke passage, um, but this one, in Isaiah 22, some of the um, citizens who, they feel like Jerusalem is going to fall, but they're like, well, let's just drink and be merry. And so they do nothing to um, show repentance or that they, you know, try to do something different than what they've been doing. They're just going to have as much fun as they can before the disaster happens. Okay, Ecclesiastes, um, these verses, remember Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. And remember when Solomon um, was young and he had just become king and he has this dream and God says, I will give you whatever you want. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. And God was so impressed with that, that not only did he give him wisdom, he also gave him riches and fame. And so Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes near the end of his reign. And he has all of these riches and all of this fame and all of this wisdom. And he goes in search of happiness. So in chapter one, Solomon says that everything here on earth is temporary and it would not last forever. And he talks about how laughter and wine did not last. And he built houses and gardens and orchards and he made pools of water and he had servants to wait on him and he had great possessions. He had silver and gold and he had singers sing to him. He had instruments of music play for him and none were lasting. But after trying all these things, Solomon said that everything was vanity or it was all for nothing. There was no lasting uh, happiness in earthly things. And then in chapter two, Solomon says there's three good things in life. They were the foods that he ate, the drink that he drank, and the work that he did. And all three of those gifts were given to him from God. And then the verses that are included from uh, chapter three, verses nine through 11, those come right after the verses that talk about, you know, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And so verses 9 through 11 basically say God has made everything beautiful in his time. Now, one of the things that you can do to kind of wake everybody up um, is to pass out bubbles to everybody or just have bubbles yourself and start blowing bubbles. Um, or asking everybody else to blow bubbles. And talk about how bubbles, when they uh, land on the table, how they last for just a second. Or if you try to grab them, that you cannot grab a bubble, it'll go away. So just like the Ecclesiastes pages, uh, passages, bubbles last only for a moment. They don't keep you happy for very long. But when I'm doing those bubbles, I get a little happy every single time I blow bubbles. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This is part of my favorite chapter in the entire Bible, the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. This is near the end. And our author suggests that we use King James Version for this verse. I actually don't like the King James Version. I like either the Contemporary English Version or the J.B. Phillips Version 
And I have both of those in my notes, but I wanna to read to you the uh, contemporary English version. Now, all we can see of God is like a cloudy picture in a mirror. Later, we will see him face to face. We don't know everything, but then we will, just as God completely understands us. Now, this may not be um, something that we really can focus on, but is something the Corinthians really could by using that type of idea of a cloudy picture in a mirror. Because Corinth, it was um, the uh, famous manufacturer of bronze mirrors. So one thing that you could do is you could bring in a sheet of polished bronze, or you could go, just go to um, Michael's or Hobby Lobby or Joann's or someplace and get a piece of paper um, of cardstock that's like shiny bronze. And then I took this one and cut it into, uh, let's see, how many pieces do I have? So nine pieces. And so just give this to them and they look into it and they can see themselves, but they can see that it's not a real clear mirror picture. It's a reflection, but it's blurry. So now we know in part, but then we'll be able to see like a clear mirror. We will be able to see everything. Um, we can only know, grasp, and understand fractions of what Jesus has told us. But when Jesus comes again, when we go with him back to heaven, we will be able to see Jesus clearly and we will know the truth. Finally, I want to share a few thoughts about climate change, since that's the name of the lesson. I have a minor in geography, and I don't remember that much about my geography classes, but I do remember some things. And so I tried to write down um, a couple of things that I remember, especially about my very first class that I took from the um, head of the geography department at the University of Houston in 1977. And one of the things that he said is that climate is constantly changing and it's based on a variety of factors. And another thing he said was that we've only had reliable temperature, temp, uh, temperature measurements for the last 140 years, although that is really questionable for the first 40, 50 years. One reason is because they did it by hand and there was just a few places and now there's like 32,000 um, places to measure uh, temperatures. Um, also the location of the weather stations have almost all of them have changed. For instance, when I was growing up, Hobby Airport was where Houston did all of its temperatures. Now Intercontinental Airport is where all of Houston's temperatures are taken. And as you know, if you live in the Houston area, it can be 10, maybe even 15 degrees difference between the temperatures in, at Hobby and the temperatures at Intercontinental. In the summertime, Intercontinental is hotter than Hobby, and in the wintertime, it is colder than Hobby. And in some weather stations, they might have been at the bottom of a mountain, and now they may be at the uh, top or partway up the mountain. So there is constantly differences in those type of measurements. Also, two thirds of the temper changes are from natural occurrences. And I remember specifically the thing he taught us about sunspots. When there is sunspots, and I always think of it as like floaters you get in your eyes, they're like little black spots on the sun. When you have sunspots, the sun is cooler and therefore the temperatures on the earth are not as drastic. And so what he had told us is right after the 1900 flood or hurricane that was in uh, Galveston, right after that is when the sunspots came on the sun. And this was in 77. And I think he said after the year of 83, the sunspots were going to go away. And whatever year it was, I remember that next year, it was like there were some dramatic changes to the weather. There were uh, big differences in clients and big hurricane problems and all of that, that next year. 
And um, so basically I was like, oh, he was right. Um, also, there's things like the winds from El Nino and La Nina do a lot of different changes in the temperatures. And then you have things like volcanoes and other natural occurrences that make temperature changes. Um, another thing you need to remember is that we're at the peak of our ice age. There are several different ice ages. And when you get to the peak, you are going to have the warmest temperatures. And I remember him saying in 1977, we are getting close to being at the peak of our ice age. And so what that means when you get to the peak is you have the warmer air. And when you have the warmer air, then it's going to cool, um, it's going to melt the ice and you're going to get more water uh, on the earth. And if you get more water on the earth, then the temperatures will get cooler. And also when the temperatures get cooler, then the clouds cannot hold as much water. And so then you're going to have more rain and snow falling on land as well as on water. And so when the land uh, gets more rainwater, such as in deserts around the equator, then those deserts are gonna become more fertile. And when you get more, uh, snow on the polar areas, you're going to have more ice. And so then that will start the next ice, or that will have us going down the peak of the ice age. And as we know, the ice age is tens of thousands of years. So I always remember too, ultimately um, humans have used technology and adaptability to improve on things. And we can always be hopeful that, that they will be doing that same thing as we change in our weather patterns. Okay, so lesson seven, economic climate justice. Um, remember the title of our study is Justice Roll Down, God's Call to Care for Neighbors and All Creation. And basically in all the lessons before this, we have been talking about creation uh, the environment and not talking about people. And so this one actually starts in and talking about people. And the very first scripture of our lesson is Deuteronomy 15, seven through 11. And in verse 10 of that uh, passage, it says, God commands us to give generously or give freely to the less fortunate and to speak up on their behalf. Therefore, I'm recommending that we change the um, title of this lesson and make it into Give Freely. Uh, the other three scriptures, they all are exactly the same scriptures. Um, they're talking about where Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And it's where uh, the disciples are saying, the woman pouring ointment on Jesus's body is wasting all this money. And what Jesus is trying to say, no, she's preparing my body for the, his upcoming burial. And that's the only thing it talks about on poor is that one statement. And there's a whole lot of biblical verses that talk about charity and justice. And so I thought I would share some of those passages in case you want to use uh, some of those ideas. By the way, the word charity in the Bible sometimes means love and sometimes it means helping out the needy. Um, okay, before I get into this first scripture, I do wanna explain one of the things that uh, I meant by give freely. I'm not talking about standing on a corner and handing out money to everybody who goes by. What I am talking about is more what Paul is getting ready to tell uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 8. And so I'm going to read it to you um, so you'll know kind of what I'm talking about. Do not speak angrily to an older uh, man, but talk to him as if he were your father. Treat younger men like brothers. Treat older women like mothers and younger women like sisters. Always treat them in a pure way. Take care of widows who are all alone. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, 
the first thing they need to learn is to do their duty to their own family. When they do this, they will be repaying their parents or grandparents. That pleases God. If a widow is all alone and without help, then she puts her hope in God and prays night and day for God's help. But, but the widow who uses her life to please herself is really dead while she is still living. Tell the believers there to do these things so that no one can say they are doing wrong. A believer should take care of his own relatives, especially his own family. If he does not do that, he is turned against the faith. He is worse than a person who does not believe in God. So I put up here the three things I got from that passage. First, we should treat all people as if they're family members. Second, family members should take care of their own. Third, do not focus on those who use their life to please themselves, for they are really dead while still living. And then if you look in our um, suggestions for leaders on page 84, she mentions um, a passage, Proverbs 31, 9. And actually, I like 31, 8 through 9. And this passage is similar to what Paul told Timothy. It says, speak on behalf of people who cannot speak for themselves. Help helpless people to receive justice. Speak clearly to help them. Judge people in a way that is fair and right. Help poor and helpless people to receive justice. So you might want to get into um, a conversation about who is a helpless person. And a helpless person is somebody who is unable to help themselves and they're powerless or they're incompetent. And then you may wanna break into groups of uh, two or three people and, and have them talk among themselves about who are helpless people that they encounter. And then what are three things that they can do, not giving money, but three other things that they can do to help those people. Then you may want to have people think of scriptures about helping the helpless. So I've got uh, nine things here that you could use to get people started in case people can't think of things. Um, you might want to ask them, what was the charity that, they, that was included in this passage and why was it the right thing to do? And a, another thing we need to kind of bring home is if you're serving others to get something, then you have missed the point. The getting part is not the reason you do the service. The reason you do the service is because it is the right thing to do. And remember what justice is, doing what is right and fair and, and impartial. And one last point is Matthew 6, 2. When you give to the poor, don't be like the hypocrites. They blow trumpets before they give so that people will see them. They do that in the synagogues and on the streets. They want other people to honor them. I tell you the truth, those hypocrites already have their full reward. And it goes back to that whole thing, serve because it's the right thing to do. Um, I've got two children's books uh, here to possibly use for this particular lesson. The first one is The Giving Tree, which you probably all know. Once there was a tree and she loved the little boy and it goes through his entire life where he becomes an old man. Um, there's a video here and what it does, it has a narrator and then pictures showing uh, the various things. And the second book is Pine and the Winter Sparrow. And it's based on a Native American fable. And it tells the story of all trees turning away an injured little sparrow, except for the pine tree who offers the bird shelter for the winter. And that's the reason why the pine tree gets to keep its leaves for the winter. And another thing I handed out to you in your handouts was the story of the stone soup. And it's a good thing to um, show how uh, when you share things, Everybody can enjoy a great meal, where if you hoard everything, then you're all, all hungry. Lesson eight, 
is intergenerational justice. And I probably had to go to five different definitions before I found a definition of what intergenerational justice really is, because apparently this is something that uh, uh, climate change people use as a, a word or so. And so the, the, the definition I found is because members of each generation shared the earth with members of the same generation and with other generations past and future, our actions, inactions, decisions, and choices today are interconnected and have far reaching and long-term consequences that affect the lives, livelihoods, quality of life and opportunities of those who will inherit the world after us. It's a very long definition, but it was the only one I could understand. And so once I understood that uh, definition, then I understood why she included the scripture passages that she included. But if you go over to page 87, um, our author talks about how the Bible's first 12 books, Genesis through 2 Kings, tells a story that begins with creation and ends in the middle of the Babylonian dominance in the 6th century BCE. And so she then goes into some information on the next couple of pages that talks about all these kings and everything. And it got kind of complicated. So I decided I needed to have a timeline for you so that you would understand kind of what she's talking about. So this is a timeline of the history of the Israelites. And as you probably know, after the death of Solomon, um, Israel split into two kingdoms. So if you look halfway through that timeline, that's the separate kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And so the Northern kingdom is Israel, the Southern kingdom is Judah. And each of those kingdoms had 20 kings. All 20 of the kings from the northern kingdom from Israel were bad kings. Eight of the 20 kings for the southern kingdom for Judah were good kings. And so th that was one reason why uh, Israel fell before Judah fell. So 722 BC is when the capital of Israel, Samaria, was taken over by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, when they um, took the, the Israelites back as servants, they split them to all parts and Israel was never to come back again as a kingdom. Um, Judah, that was the Southern kingdom. Um, when this happened in 722, when the uh, capital of Israel was taken over by the Assyrians, the kingdom was run by King Ahaz, and he was a very bad king. And one of the things that King Ahaz did in Judah is he nailed the doors shut to the temple in Jerusalem. But then when King Ahaz died, his son Hezekiah became king, and he was a good king. And then when uh, Hezekiah, um, when he died, then his son was a bad king, Manasseh. And then when Manasseh died, his son was a good king, Josiah. And so our scripture, 2 Kings uh, 22, 20, and 23, 25, and 23, 29 through 30, then 2 Kings 24 and 25, and 2 Kings 25, 27 through 30, talk about all of this other time. And it's basically talking about King Josiah. And so King Josiah had some good mentors. He was only eight years old when he took over as king. And one of the things he did is he unnailed the doors of the temple in Jerusalem. And when he went in, he found the um, God's commandments. And when he read those commandments, he broke down and he started crying. And he started then um, trying to get back into the covenant that God had with the Israelites. And he started telling the Israelites that they needed to do various things. And so what these King, second Kings passages do is they go through and they start talking about the various things that happened during that time frame, And that's what she explains on page 88 of our book. So let's go back and talk about opening. 
the um, alternate prayer from what they've suggested in the suggestions for leaders would be to do Psalm 39, four through five. And uh, another one is second Timothy one, five through seven. And so I would like to include, uh, tell you what second Timothy one, five through seven is. I remember your true faith. That kind of faith first belonged to your grandmother Lois and to your mother Eunice. And I know that you now have that same faith. That is why I remind you to use the gift God gave you. God gave you that gift when I laid my hands on you. Now let it grow as a small flame grows into a fire. God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid. He gave us a spirit of power and love and self-control. And then I would, of course, end with amen. So we've seen the impact an individual has. And so one of the things that um, she talks about in page 88 is that the mentors had an impact on King Josiah. That impact was making sure that he opened up the, um, the temple that was in Jerusalem. That impact was helping him to go and read God's book of the law and to restore that covenant with God. And that impact made um, King Josiah tell everybody to get rid of all of their idols. And they restored all of the things that God told them to do, all of the commandments that God told them to do. And because of what King Josiah did, the second Kings 23, 25, um, it says is the legacy that King Josiah will have. And it says, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So you may want to break your uh, group into people of two or three, and then ask, have them talk about who has been a mentor to them, and what influence have they had in your life and the lives of others or in the world. And then talk about what legacy do you want to leave? So I looked up uh, the definition of a legacy and so I have it here. It's money or property bequeathed to another by will, something passed down to generations after us and rare and special gifts from one person to another. But a legacy is more than that. A legacy is a testament to character of, ind of an individual. It's a source of inspiration and encouragement to others. It's a treasure trove of wisdom and knowledge and experience that can be passed down from generation to generation. And if you want to leave a good le legacy, then be a good mentor. So I've included some um, scriptures here that you can go through and talk about how do you do all of those things? How do you be a good mentor? And so you live a life, uh, a godly, a life of godly character and conduct, and you stand up for what you believe, and you demonstrate godly love and you care. And so here are some scriptures that you can do all of those things. And one of the things you need to remember is your legacy is not made on your deathbed. That may be where it's revealed but that's not where it's made. So you need to remember to be faithful to God, to your family, and to what you know is right, what is just. And then for the closing prayer, I have another Psalm. And this one, I would suggest printing it out and then get having each person maybe read a verse or a line, however many people that you have and using that as uh, your closing prayer. Lesson nine. Um, I see we're at 12.01, but I, we're almost through. So we're good to go. Um, again, I've got some videos and some slideshows. We started off with videos that kind of talk about what we need to do a better job in taking care of God's world. And so what I thought is in lesson nine, we needed to end with the beauty of uh, the earth. 
And so Planet Two, Planet Earth Two and the beauty of Earth are, are videos and then slideshow for the beautiful nature photo and the amazing animals. Um, these are things I would suggest you play as you're, as people are coming in, not taking up the time um, for the lesson, but as people are coming in, just have pictures going. And then for the prayer, you could do the For the Beauty of the Earth uh, lyrics, but there's a passage that we have, Psalm 104, is part of our, our scriptures for this lesson. And I have a link here to a video of some beautiful pictures that is being played as a narrator is reading Psalm 104. And the version of Psalm 104 that she's reading is the New International Version. So I would probably print that out so that people can follow along as she reads it. And then afterwards, use some follow-up questions. And you might use the two questions on page 102 of our lesson. What are your favorite lines in the Psalm and why? What do you see in your imagination when you read or hear these lines? Would you prefer for verse 35 to be, um, about, it's about sinners, to be omitted or not? Um, there's some other questions you might want to also follow up with, like what does this passage teach us about God's character? How can we show that we appreciate God's creation? Why do you think God created such a diverse range of living creatures? Psalm 104 reminds us that every single thing we do has an impact on the world around us. This psalm reminds us of God's greatness and power and how we are called to care for his creation. Whoops. Okay, our um, author spends quite a bit of time talking about biomimicry on page 99. And if you uh, look under the subtitle of Imitating Nature, down at near the bottom of the right-hand column on 98 and then going over to 99, um, biomimicry is basically human innovations inspired by nature. And on page 99, she tells us, we have a tremendous amount to learn from plants and animals that have thrived billions of years longer than humans have lived on earth. And you think about that, that's right. They've done a, they've been here a whole lot longer than we have. So why not look and see what they have figured out? And it lists right above that, um, several different things that humans have learned from animals, such as how to repel bacteria, desalinate water, store carbon dioxide, and gather and use the sun's energy. And then I have some other examples here of things that animals have inspired us to do. And of course, I have videos. Um, the videos down at the bottom, I, I guess I prefer the first one. I didn't put an asterisk by it, but I, I kind of like it because it's more um, professionally done. It's from the CBS Sunday Morning Show. And so it talks about biomimicry. Also, it's five minutes and 59 seconds, where the other one is 10 minutes and four seconds. But the second one actually gives you more ideas of uh, things that happen. Like it talks about the mosquito needle nose um, and uh, about the birds with the, uh, the bullet trains and stuff like that. So I've listed some of them in there that are also talked about in the video. Uh, the Isaiah and the Micah passages that are included in lesson nine are very similar. Uh, Isaiah and Micah were uh, prophets at the same time. And if you look on page 100, you will see, um, I can turn over to it. You will see under vines and fig trees, the passage of Micah 4, 1 through 4. And I've highlighted verse 3 and 4 up here on the slide. Um, basically, this whole passage, it paints a very vivid picture of a time when peace will be prevailing and righteousness will be upheld and God's divine justice will be the norm. 
and it encourages us to endure faith and it, it's hopeful for a future secured by divine justice and got it, guided by God's unchanging love. And the part in verse three that says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And if you look at that picture to the left, that is the sculpture that the USSR, the Soviet Union, um, they put together that sculpture and sent it over to New York and it sits outside of the United Nations building. And on it, it says um, something, a gift, let's see, a gift uh, of union, um, union of Soviet Socialist Republic to the United Nations, 1959. And I really find that very funny because in 1959 is when the Soviets were closing all the churches and telling everybody that they shouldn't be um, Christians. And yet they make this sculpture and give it to the UN uh, uh, with this passage here. And then also I highlighted, but they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees because it explains that in our, our passage there. Later on, in, uh, she tells you over in the right column on page 100 that uh, this, was, this passage was used in the movement in East Germany that moved the way for uh, Germany to reunify into a single country. Um, the next one I wanna talk about is on page 101. Our author talks about Matthew 13, 31 through 32. And what you may wanna do is you may want to get, I don't know if you can see this, let's see here. I have a little bag here of mustard seeds and you may wanna get some mustard seeds to the ladies so that they can look at how small mustard seeds are. Um, the mustard seed is the smallest seeds, seed in size, but even though it's so small, it grows to a mustard tree that is 20 to 30 feet tall. So this picture that is over on, on the left-hand side is a mustard tree and you see people standing in front of it. So the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which someone took and sowed. The kingdom of heaven being a reality on earth started from the smallest of tribes, the Israelites. God chose a people small in stature and number, and that was the, the group of people that he wanted to reveal himself to the world. And so God, his people were like that small seed of faith, and it allowed them to be resilient and to be adaptable. And the world's population is 8 billion people, but one third of the population are Christians. It's the largest of all of the religions. And just like um, the Israelites are, were one of the smallest, but yet their seed of faith has brought this Christian um, religion to so much of the world, it all started with a mustard seed of faith. And just like that, Sustaining creation's health for all starts with a mustard seed of action from one individual. And Billy Graham said, if we each see the world as a gift from God, we will do our best to take care of it and use it wisely instead of poisoning or destroying it. So I want to end with uh, the closing prayer that's in our book on page 102. God who creates and recreates, renew our vision and invigorate our souls that we may both see and seek the world you desire for all. Help us translate hope into daily actions in the corner of the earth that we call home. Amen. All right. So does anybody have any questions? If so, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, I'll see if I can answer any questions. No? Okay, great. Um, oh, wait, from Bethel. Right. 
Let's see here. I'm trying to do everything at once. Oh, we got an amen. Oh, that's good. <laughs> All right. So I will try to send a link to you whenever the webmaster puts the PowerPoint slides out on the web page. And uh, then you can go back and you can read all of the notes pages. It, it, I try to keep all my notes on there. And so that hopefully that'll help you out. And if you um, want to follow the book, great, follow the book. If you want to uh, try to follow my lessons, I tried to give you enough information that it will give you enough to have an entire lesson. Okay, before right. we're done, I would like very much to thank you. It is amazing how much research you have done and how much work you have done for us. I don't think much of videos, but you've opened my eyes. Thank you so much for this session. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, girls. Ladies, we'll uh, talk to you soon. Hopefully, um, I might see you at, at one of the spring gatherings or at an in-person overview. We'll talk to you later. Have a great day.